G'day, Andrew Whitney here, and I'm down at my local creek on a foggy morning in uh, Melbourne, Australia, in the um, what we think might be the middle of winter, or maybe it's the uh, towards the end of it. And occasionally we get these foggy mornings, and uh, I like to get out and take uh, photos in the fog using uh, black and white film. So uh, I'm photographing today with my my Leica. 3G camera with a 50mm lens, no need for a uh, filter or anything else, and uh, I can see uh, it's time to take some photos, and we'll see how they turn out afterwards. Now there's an old adage in black and white film photography and darkroom printing, which says that with a low contrast scene, such as this fog scene, we should underexpose our negative slightly at the time of photography, and then overdevelop it substantially during film processing. And that's what I'm going to do here. We know that we have a low contrast scene mainly because we have what we could call overcast lighting rather than sunny lighting. And that's the first precursor of a low contrast scene. Furthermore, we have a scene which is formed internally of similarly toned and coloured objects. So it's intrinsically low contrast in itself. With the two standout bright areas being the white sky and its reflection in the water. If we shoot this scene at a normal exposure setting and then give it normal film development, then we're going to get a dark, muddy looking picture. A real disappointment. We've all had those. So instead, we'll underexpose slightly and then overdevelop a lot. Underexposing the film will cause the darkest parts of the scene to appear blacker in the print, whilst overdevelopment, and this is the really important part, will cause the midtones and brighter parts of the scene to move up the tonal scale to appear brighter. This will complete an overall tonal and contrast expansion, which is what we need in order to make an easy, good-looking print. So to do this, I'll begin by setting my light meter to a slightly higher ISO setting than the film's box speed. Then when I make my light readings, I'll simply measure the overall scene, but with a slight bias towards the foreground and darker areas and with less bias to the sky, as you would typically do with most landscape photos. Then I'll set the camera according to the light meter. Gotcha. And here's the finished negative. I've already previewed it on my iPad in positive form, and I've selected it for printing, possibly as an oversized A4 print for display in my portfolio and also on my wall. And for the purpose of comparison, here's another negative of a similar scene which was given normal film development. You can see how much less contrast and density it has. This negative will produce a comparatively dark, muddy looking print. In black and white film and darkroom print photography, a good negative is the first step in getting a good, easy print. And here's a small whole frame 6x9 centimetre test print, thus about the size of a credit card. Due to the extra film development, I'm getting good print contrast with just a low contrast grade 1.5 printing filter. And the picture isn't printing dark or muddy. I like this exposure level, so now I'll compute the exposure time needed to make a matching larger print that's a bit bigger than A4. Processing the larger final enlargement now. And here's the final A4 print, which will dry down to look fractionally darker and thus match more closely the appearance of its smaller test print. Now speaking of prints, and given that we're printing in a dark room, we should consider which finish of paper we might like to use to print our fog photos on. For my fog photos, I like to use this Ilford Classic Matte Fiber Based Paper. This paper has a very fine, almost velvety matte surface, which I think is just right for fog photos. Being a very matte finished paper, it has an intrinsically lower contrast, all of its own. Meaning that most noticeably, it can't produce as deep a black as a glossy paper can and this makes it more difficult to work with visually, and you also need to expect a typical dry-down factor of about 10%, as you would with most matte papers. 
It also tends to process up in most developers with a rather drab cold grey image colour which I dislike intensely. Perhaps for these reasons of low contrast and drab neutral image colour, this paper is consistently priced at my photo supply store at only three quarters of the price of Ilford's premium glossy and matte warm-toned fibre-based papers, both of which offer more contrast and a warmer image tone. However, this classic matte paper has, I think, the more interesting looking matte finish, and I found that it processes up with a very pleasing, slightly warm image colour, and with good contrast and blacks, when developed in a homemade mix of Ansel Adams 55D Warm Tone Paper Developer, the formula of which I've included here. And here are some of the other fog photos, which I've taken here at my local creek in the fog with my 35mm film camera, and then developed and enlarged in the darkroom. To show them to you here, I've photographed my finished oversized A4 prints with my digital camera using a photocopying setup, and you can, of course, also produce very satisfactory digital images from your finished prints by shooting them with your smartphone or by scanning them. Personally, I try to include some kind of active life in my scenes. For example, a person or an animal. People are easy to photograph candidly in the fog because at a slight distance they can't really see what you're doing. Of course, the natural landscape itself, just by itself, is full of life too. Remember, of course, that the inclusion of people and animals gives your picture scale, which in turn helps to create the illusion of depth and space. Of course, the other thing that creates depth and space is the fog effect itself, as it causes objects to appear lighter as they recede into the distance. This simplification of tones and masses is one of the things I like best about fog photos, and it can simplify one's compositions. Another thing I've discovered with fog photos is that you don't need a lot of fog in your original scene to get a foggy looking picture, provided that you leave all filters off your lens, in particular UV filters, and coloured filters such as yellow, orange, green, red, which will normally block ultraviolet and blue light and will thus decrease the fog effect. Then you'll find that the black and white film process will tend to naturally amplify the fog effect. So if you have just a slightly foggy scene, then you'll get an obviously foggy looking picture. And if you've got an obviously thick fog to start with, then you'll wind up with a real pea super in your print. So you'll typically find that you'll conveniently get more fog in your finished picture than what you started with. So there it is, a journey into the fog using black and white film, modified film processing and darkroom enlarging. It's a good way to get some interesting paper prints for your portfolio or wall. See you next time, but it probably won't be in the fog. <laughs>